Thank you very much, and uh, it's really quite an honor to be part of this panel, and hopefully I can maintain the quality of the talk for this next one. Uh, perhaps I can get my slides from you if you don't mind. Just while we're waiting for the slides to come up, just by way of show of hands so we know who the audience members are. How many people here are nurses or have nursing background? Allied Health, Physiotherapy, Occupational Therapy, other. Of the physicians in the room, how many do intensive care, surgery, lots, other? Are we building the wrong room? All right, good. We're fine. <laughs> Carry on. All right, so um, I have these disclosures. I have no um, uh, specific relevance to these disclosures for this particular talk. So if you get bored or you have to go or something else in the interim, if you remember nothing else from this talk, if you can remember this one slide, which was stolen from Paul Wishmeyer from, from Duke, um, if your, if your patient leaves the hospital alive, which is the traditional metric that we use for success after a heart operation, is that good enough? And I'm gonna show you some examples where I think that may not be the case, and speaking somewhat to what Kevin's very nicely dovetailed into my particular talk. So in order to convince you of that, I'll give you a brief case example, explain why things like frailty and prehab are important to the cardiothoracic patient and what we can do, possibly do about this. If you're so inclined in the social media spheres, please feel free to tweet wherever you see, wherever you'd like, except when you see the upside down dead Twitter bird. Those are things that are not yet published or if things I've borrowed from other people, I'd appreciate if you don't tweet. We are on Twitter as well for the ERAS Cardiac Society as well. Okay, so case example, probably very typical for most of us who are in the surgical world. 73-year-old lady comes in with critical AS and has concurrent three-vessel coronary artery disease and gets put forth to you as an outpatient consult for surgery. Over the period of time when you first see her to when she has to be go for surgery, she has a progressive decline in her um, exercise capacity and such she now has features of heart failure, less than one flight of exercise tolerance and has features of orthopnea and peripheral edema. So you dutifully go through your scoring system and for our center in Winnipeg, we use the Euroscore too and we put that score in and looking at her features in terms of her age, uh, being a female sex, having a combined procedure, and now new heart failure symptoms, that gives you an operative risk of about two and a half to three percent. Most of us would feel pretty comfortable, take an eyeball test, if we go, ah, off you go, and you go for surgery. So this patient undergoes this procedure, has an AVR, a biprosthetic AVR, with a four vessel bypass. Unfortunately, has sort of a prolonged course after her operation in the ICU. She remains intubated for five days. She actually get extubated and got reintubated due to failure, uh, due to hypoxemia and hypercapnic respiratory failure, and eventually goes on to get a tracheostomy. In the interims of all this, she gets septic, has a, a new ventilator associated pneumonia, develops acute kidney injury, and has a prolonged stay in hospital. So eventually she is well enough to go home, but unfortunately we found out she lives alone, which about 25% 25 25 of our patients do, in our, at least in our center, and she gets admitted to a long-term care facility. We've now used this term now to describe patients like this who's had poor functional survival. So good functional survival, and this is something we just made up to be honest a few years ago, but we published it four times, so I guess it counts as a, a real term, is that someone who's alive and living in their own home versus someone who's either expired from their, from sometime after their operation or gets admitted to a long-term care facility. I think most of our patients who come to us, particularly those in an outpatient setting such as this, would not deem going somewhere other than home as being successful uh, part of their operation. So the difficulty is our scoring systems don't really encapsulate some of the things that if you were to be more detailed in your evaluation of this particular patient, that may be important. For example, something, as, something called frailty. In most scoring systems, for example, in the Euroscore 2, this is classified as poor mobility. However, this is largely a nebulous sort of um, assessment, and it's usually related to some degree of an eyeball test. For those who may not be familiar with what frailty is, it's basically a catch-all term for a number of things that are related to an older adult primarily, but not always related to chronologic age, where you have features of weakness related to poor muscle mass or sarcopenia, malnutrition, cognitive issues, and mood issues, all related to this umbrella term called frailty. The difficulty for most of these patients, including this particular patient in our center who was just seen in the surgeon's office, when you look from the outside, the patient looked fit enough to go for surgery. And so I'm gonna use a car analogy for Kevin, and if you look at Kevin's Twitter profile, you know why that's appropriate for him. Um, if you have a car that's clearly broken down or rusted like this or missing a door, that patient's obviously not gonna do very well. Or that car wouldn't do very well in a car race. However, most cars don't look like that. They may look a bit older perhaps, they may have slightly different colors, they may have a mirror that's a little bit cracked, but from the outside, most cars of a certain age look about the same. If you were then to say look at that particular fuel gauge in that car and one had a full tank of gas 
and then when a nearly empty tank of gas, obviously one of those cars will go a lot farther in the car race than the other. Traditionally, when we look at patients, we look at them from the outside and don't do a detailed assessment of how much fuel they have left in the tank. And that's a good analogy for frailty. Another way to look at it is those who've aged successfully versus those who haven't. <coughs> and understanding the age of a patient, not just from a chronologic standpoint, but a biologic standpoint, something I think we as a cardiothoracic surgery community need to move towards. So we looked at this, and I won't do this in terms of the time we have, go through this very quickly, but when you look at the impact of frailty and negative outcomes, for example, in this particular case we looked at delirium, when you actually do a comprehensive assessment of frailty in our patients using any number of different tools that are out there, about half of our patients can be deemed frail. And if you're frail, you have worse functional survival, that means being either dead or admitted to somewhere other than your own home preoperatively, and negative outcomes after surgery that are probably very important to the patient, for example, delirium and other things. When you look at the features that seem to predict those patients that don't do well from a frailty phenotype, it's traditionally related to things that may or may not be related to muscle wasting and therefore may or may not be able to be fixed if given the appropriate amount of time before their operation. In this particular study, we looked at the things that would be most impactful in terms of negative outcomes were weight loss and weak hand grip strength. Other people have shown poor gait speed and so forth. So, the question then is, if you have someone who has a low level of fuel in their tank or have high degrees of frailty, can you refill that tank? Or said differently, can you defrail a patient? And that's a question that we're particularly interested in. So going back again to Kevin's talk, this is a study now from 18 years ago, so which due to be now, I guess, be recognized by all of us in the room. This is from a Canadian Centre of McMaster in Hamilton in Ontario and Canada, where they took about 200 and some patients and put them through a preoperative exercise program the same kind of program they use for the cardiac rehabilitation after their heart surgery. And they in fact found there was a significant improvement in their median hospital length of stay, as well as a composite score of health related quality of life measures for both mental and physical capacity. So that was pretty impactful. This was now done sort of the late 90s and the early 2000s, published in 2000, on relatively lower risk, younger patients undergoing isolated bypass surgery. That isn't the patient that, in the example I gave to you today, which is probably more common what we see now. So we're now moving to a phase of how to look at this in the older adult, particularly those with some degree of frailty. This is the pre up study that we're currently doing in Canada. This is some pilot data from some older uh, patients with lower ejection fractions who could be deemed at higher risk. And this is a bit of a, a busy slide, but I'll walk you through it. There's basically two components to this where we looked at exercise capacitance in terms of a six minute walking test, which is a good marker of how much, how much capacity they have, as well as your gait speed. Uh, Jonathan Afalalo from Montreal has shown that when you have a poor gait speed or a slow gait speed, that's associated with increased mortality, particularly when added to the SDS PROM score. So those patients in the black are those who got the standard of care, which is the routine thing. We say, off you go, wait for your surgery. We see you in a few days or weeks when it's time for your procedure, versus those who underwent an eight-week program where we went through an exercise program as well as mental health assessments, diabetes management, nutrition assessments, smoking sensation, and other factors, all part of what we think is important for prehabbing a vulnerable older adult patient. In the yellow bars, you can see what happened at the beginning and at the end of their protocol. So this is when we first saw the patient to when they actually came for their surgery. And we had a significant increase in the six minute walk test, as well as a significant improvement or a more quick um, uh, gait speed uh, during that particular period of time. The other thing that was really important about this, which is attitudinal change, about 30% of our patients after heart surgery will actually go on to cardiac rehab after their surgery. In this study, those patients who went through the prehab program, 100% of them went on to a post-operative program. So the attitudinal change we think is quite interesting as well, which is often quite recalcitrant to change. So we're now doing a multi-center trial and we hope to have some data for you the next sort of 18 months or so in this particular regard. Okay, so knowing that we're a little over time, I'll try to wrap it up. Um, in summary, frailty is common, probably far more common than we understand by just simply doing the eyeball test. It probably behooves all of us to be more mindful of this and actually go through some process of detailed assessment of how much fuel is left in your particular patient's tank before they go through the surgical procedure. If you don't, they're at higher risk or poor functional survival, which could be deemed as a not successful outcome for that patient, at least from their perspective. 
These seem to be driven by things that may be fixable, such as sarcopenia and nutrition, which are theoretically something we can intervene in before their operation. <coughs> so I think we need to look for opportunities to optimize your patients. There may be a benefit between delaying and not operating. I think that data still needs to come out from further multi-center trial, which we hope to be able to provide for you, and look for opportunities perhaps to defrail our patients. So when looking at these guidelines that we're putting out, or not, I guess we can't call them guidelines, when this expert consensus opinion statement, statement um, that we want to put out that you have uh, drafts for you around in this room and in the break room next door. This is a little teaser for the session we're going to have on Tuesday. We've labeled the prehabilitation as possibly being beneficial for your patients with a class 2A uh, with a B uh, non-randomized control trial sort of level of evidence. All that seems well and good, but the trials, uh, the studies that we did in our particular, sorry, the screening tools we used in our particular study are relatively comprehensive and probably not that functional for most of us in a busy clinical setting. So this is an important study from last year from, again, a multi-center study looking at frailty assessments in TAVR and SAVR patients where we tried to distill this down to really what's the essential parts of frailty assessments that are necessary to predict negative outcomes in your patients. And this is shown for you here and the references for you there as well. And if you have an iPhone, and there is actually an app for that now that you can use to quickly assess frailty with very simple markers in your clinic before the operation. It's not yet available for Android, but it's coming. And if you're so inclined, there's actually a webinar in this next week uh, by Jonathan on, in Canada. Lastly, I have these acknowledgments for people who have helped me with some of my slides and have plagiarized some of their content del deliberately, as well as my whole research team that you can see for you there. And lastly, as always, a gratuitous picture of my kids in any talk, and hopefully I've kept you awake more than my kids when I talk to them. Thanks very much.